transport you to the hospital. Well, all the metal leak of splints were supports, were metal. Metal was being used for bullet, bullets. So they commissioned them to get something out of a less expensive material that was lightweight, could be shipped easily. Well, they decided to make it out of molds and wood. However, this is not like anything I had shown you out of molds and wood. If I don't think I showed you anything out of, well, bent wood. This goes up the back of the leg. Your heel goes here, goes up all the way to the back of the thigh, and these openings are what, you know, straps go through to support it. When uh, I bought one of these from a dealer, I mean, there was a, a wave of them were discovered in Philadelphia several years ago, you know, un, in a warehouse somewhere. So a lot of mid-century dealers were selling them. And I got one, and I hung it up over, actually over the dining room area, and people walk into the house and don't know what it is because it looks like a piece of sculpture. Um, but in order to do this, anyway, back to the Eameses, there is no existing mold that's able to, able to do it, so they invent their own from a bicycle pump. And they've invented, at the expense of the Army, new technology to develop the, at the expense of the Navy. After the war, the Navy doesn't need any more splints. They have this technology, and they start thinking, maybe we could do something with it. Maybe we can adapt it to make chairs. So they started trying to make a one-piece molded chair. What's different about this than anything that happened before, you're going to see not till next week, you'll see a chair made by Alvar Alto in Sweden that is laminated, bent plywood like this, but laminated just in two directions, just laterally. This goes laminated, no, curved. It's bent this way, and it's bent this way. Maybe you can't see. So bent, what? Bent laterally, and what's the opposite of that? Bent in two directions. So that's what was new about this. They couldn't do it in one piece. They made this. Now, this is DCM, which means dining chair metal, just to decipher it. They also had DCW, dining chair wood. This is actually LC, LCW, which is lounge chair wood and there was lounge chair metal. Just so you know how they got these names. This was the first one. Um, these are, you know, $8.50 when they first made them. $8, I saw a price, price list from Herman Miller. They were a mass produced. They were meant to be an inexpensive chair that everybody could buy. This was more expensive. This lounge chair was made of sections which moved independently. And it's still made. It was originally rosewood. Some of the rosewood is rare. It's made now in uh, walnut. With, and, and it's knocked off in cheaper wood with laminate instead of leather. Uh, not laminate, with uh, pl uh, what, plastic instead of leather. These are the Eames modular um, storage units. And these, again, were made with factory units. This is um, fiberglass, standard drawers of standard uh, <coughs> a, a, a aluminum, aluminum uh, structural uh, uh, metal. So this was off the rack stuff that they put together and still made. Um, this, a lot of this furniture stayed in production continually. The rest of it came back. I'm not showing you everything. This is original fiberglass. This was molded fiberglass, couldn't be made when it was first invented. The molds couldn't handle all of these changes in the form. This was their idea of a, of a take on an 18th century French chaise. Well, it's now being made by Vitra because the technology exists to make it. Um, they made this last year very narrow couch for the film producer, Billy Wilder, who wanted to be able to take a nap in his office. They made air, uh, uh, airport housing office furniture. They made, oh, this was, Charles designed a lot of the advertising brochures. Eames Gray did textiles like this, which were taken from her imagination. Eero Saradon looked like this and did the womb chair for Noel. The uh, Eameses brought him into Noel. And the tulip, which is the tulip shape, the pedestal chair, and the cantilever chair 
are the only two totally new 20th century chair shapes. He wanted this to be entirely molded, uh, molded plastic. And it couldn't be, they didn't have, uh, it couldn't be strong enough. So this is uh, cast aluminum, painted white. And the top of it is molded plastic. And Saarinen also designed the Miller House in Columbus, Indiana, which is a city of architecture done by famous architects because Erwin Miller, uh, president, uh, then president of Cummins Engine, a very successful firm in Columbus, decided, he told the city fathers he would pay all the architectural fees if they would select an important architecture for every city building. He wasn't to select them, they would select, but he'd pay the fees to prove that good architecture wasn't going to cost any more once you paid the architect. So that there is a library by I.M. Pei, a Harry Weiss, uh, uh, what is it, the newspaper plant of both Saren and Senior and Junior design churches there. If you ever have the chance to go to Columbus, which is about an, outside, an hour outside of Indianapolis, it's worth seeing. Um, the Miller House, which Alexander Gerard did the interiors, of which Alexander Gerard did the interiors, is the first recorded sunken living room. Um, pit, seating conversation pits were a big deal at this point, or afterwards. Harry Bertoya, a few years later, Bertoya was another Cranbrook Academy grad, graduate. All, many of the most important first generation American designers and first generation, I mean the ones born in America, as opposed to the ones that came here and made careers. Bertoy is primarily a sculpture, but he did the diamond, which was an indoor-outdoor line of furniture. I mean, this line, once he did it covered, it was indoors. Warren Plattner, a while later, was an architect who designed these pieces, which also include seating, but I do want to show you only chairs. George Nelson became, remember after Gilbert Brody died, design director of Herman Miller. He had been a journalist. So he was design director, which means he came up with ideas and he sort of edited other people's ideas. Just showing you his classic bench. Um, part of the share is I'll show you more, a series of decorative clocks. This, the, called the marshmallow sofa, everything got fun names. The marshmallow sofa was made, these were bar stool tops. And these could be easily produced. So he got the idea of let's make a piece of furniture out of them on a uh, melted iron frame. Again, this is the coconut chair. You can see like a slice of coconut. These were bubble lamps. So uh, here they set up a separate company to make the lighting. And Howard Miller Company, which made all of the, uh, the one you see all the time is this one. These others, and it turns out, uh, these others are more rare, but it turns out, as would be the case, somebody in Nelson's office actually did all the clocks. And the man named Urban Harper. But he was working for George Nelson, so the clocks were all credited to George Nelson, Inc. But in recent years, people have dug into the archives and are giving credit to some of the others. Alexander Gerard was one of the most brilliant textile designers and interior designers, but textiles and graphics. He did, there's a Fondo del Sol restaurant now in the um, MetLife building, but it's, it's a reconstruction. It's not the Fondo del Sol originally, which was a much more sophisticated version of Mexican or um, South American uh, decor, and this kind of textile design Gerard did. Paul McCobb did the first mass-produced American model. And Noguchi, who was primarily a sculptor of, um, and there's the Noguchi Museum in Long Island City, a sculpture of Japanese descended lamps, which are still made, which are drawn from Japanese paper lanterns, and this is most famous piece of furniture this ubiquitous coffee table of two organic forms, the cloud form sofa. This is a chess table made for Conrad Goodyear, the president of the museum, the board of directors, and this, many other things. I'm showing you highlights. My thesis topic, so I had to include him. Edward Worley is one of three designers I'm going to show you who didn't necessarily want to go modern without rejecting tradition. 
So they did modern designs that were drawing on tradition. Vladimir Kagan's the only one still alive who was seeing himself revived. Uh, I'm sorry, four designers. Rob John Gibbings, Gibbings was an expatriate Englishman who revived the Klismos chair, among other things, and Harvey Trover. Similar to Wormley was designing the kind of furniture that people who had no in their office wanted to come home and design a little bit more warmer, less extreme modern in their homes. And Florence Knoll, last. Florence Knoll, who was Florence Schuss, who was another Cranmer graduate, married Hans Knoll and said, hey, we've got all these Mies van der Rohe and Berger things, but it's not enough for whole office. You haven't got sofas, you haven't got um, coffee table, well, you have some, you haven't got credenzas. So she designed what she called fill-in pieces, which are sort of the classic modern sofa that you wouldn't look at as innovative, but were not available on the market. And Noel Planning Unit was the first contract design firm. You know what contract design is non-residential. Everything that is not residential. And contract design was a new thing. So the Noel Planning Unit had all of it. And they, these are some of their original designs the kind of layout they did in the kind of mostly sort of neutral and warm color color schemes. This was for, I think this was Connecticut, the life insurance in the, uh, somewhere in Connecticut, which was one of their most published early interiors. Mid-century French just